Well, today I'm spending some time with uh, William Vanderblumen, the founder of the Vanderblumen search firm. And in fact, William, I've actually done two searches with you guys. And uh, both of those searches turned out wonderfully. Both those guys are doing well. And the reality is you made our team stronger. We found two guys that we would not have found on our own. So thank you wow. so much. Thanks, man. That's always good to hear. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you've recently authored a book called Next, and it's about uh, succession planning for pastors and churches. It's getting ready to come out, I, I believe, this week. And um, what prompted you to write that book? Yeah, you know, uh, Paul, we work with all different kinds of churches, finding all different sort of staff. And of all the people that come to us saying, I want to be a children's pastor, student pastor, senior pastor, associate pastor, the one thing that we very rarely hear is, I want to be an interim pastor, right? It's not the sexiest job title. And some people are called to it. That's great. But as the longer I've done this, the more I've realized one sentence dawned on me that kind of birthed this book. And it's this. Every pastor is an interim pastor. And, and by that, I mean, you know, if you're serving a church right now, the way I see it, there are really three options for how what comes after your ministry. Either you run the church into the ground and it closes, or uh, Jesus could return, which would be cool, but we might want to make some contingency plans. Uh, and then the third, and I think the only other option is somebody's going to come after you. And I started reading about it because there's not there are a few good resources for the church, but there's not a real comprehensive resource. And so I read in the corporate world because a lot of times we can check some of the best practices in the corporate world and adopt them. And what I found was Fortune 500 CEOs are often asked to start their succession planning at their very first board meeting. And I just thought, wow, you know, pastors are afraid to have this conversation because you know, at, having served as a pastor, if if I talked about my possible successor, I would be worried that the board thinks I'm leaving or that, you know, don't have it anymore or whatever, you know, paranoia there might be because it's been sort of a taboo conversation. So we try to put a resource out there that'll help pastors, that'll uh, help start a conversation, certainly not a cookie cutter or a eight steps to or magic formula, but uh, we think it's got some pretty good information and uh, cool stories in it. Now, the research for this book actually began about a year, year and a half ago or so with uh, Warren Bird from Leadership Network. Uh, what did that research process look like for you guys? Yeah, well, it was a combination of a couple of things. You know, Warren knows everyone in the kingdom, so that's a helpful thing. And he's a super researcher and was a joy to work with. Um, so that was a nice start. And then, you know, we're we're moving toward our 600th search now in the time we've been working. So you get enough reps in and you start to see patterns. So that, that, that gave us kind of a base knowledge. Uh, we looked at about 500 different transitions and what uh, had happened there. And then we went deep with about 200 case studies. Uh, we looked at good successions. We talked to one church, uh, Bethany World Prayer Center over in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, very large church. And the founder passed the church on to his son, who then at 55 or 6, I think, passed it to his son. So now the grandson serving. So very unusual. We looked at more traditional denominational successions. We looked at places that blew up. Like if you read the book, you'll hear what, there's one chapter, what really happened at the Crystal Cathedral and First Baptist Dallas. And, and that research took a long time. So, uh, <laughs> but, you know, it's not a tabloid, but there are some pretty, pretty cool insights and stories that come out of that research. There's also a lot of data, like uh, we found out, you know, what's the average tenure of a pastor in the U.S.? Uh, it's about eight years. Um, what are the average ages of the top 100 pastors of the top 100 churches in the country? So kind of a cool combination of data and story that uh, should be a nice guidebook for pastors and their boards. Now, with all of that research, with all of the data, with all the anecdotal stories, um, what were some of the most significant trends that came out of the research, William? Yeah, well, a few things, and some of them are probably intuitive. So, you know, who was it that said the best, the greater part of instruction is being reminded of things you already know. So, you know, sometimes you do research just to confirm what you think. So the, probably the biggest takeaway is a good leave, whether you're a young pastor that's moving on to a different church or a retiring pastor, a good leave rises and falls on the person that's leaving. And, uh, you know, it, it, 
even if you're the student pastor leaving because you're planting a church or something like that, how you leave makes more of a difference for your legacy than you can know. We say it like this. People remember how you leave a lot longer than they'll remember what you did while you were there. Um, that was one thing, um, you know, in like we looked at a lot of legacy churches of uh, I think in the top hundred largest churches, according to outreach this year, like 45 of them are first generation churches. So the founder is still there. And that might be a young guy like Steve Furtick. It might be an older guy. But uh, it, it, so we took a long look at founders and what happens with founders. Uh, we found that most of them stay too long. And uh, that's kind of a you know, I don't want to be Debbie Downer or anything, but uh, it, it, we feel like we, we call it Brett Favre syndrome, yeah. you know, if that makes sense. Uh, the same thing that made Brett Favre a great quarterback and able to stand in the pocket better than most, if, if not any, was uh, a, a shadow side voice that whispered in his head, you got one more year, man. You can do it one more time. And I think pastors uh, sometimes fall into that trap. Uh, a couple of the reasons that it, that people do stay too long. Uh, churches and pastors don't do well planning financially. Uh, we tried to outline some things that boards ought to be doing for their pastors financially to, to make retirement an option. And it's not a, well, I got to keep making money. Uh, we also laid out some plans for pastors on how they could, you know, approach their board and what they ought to be doing financially to plan. And, and another piece would be uh, just their pastoral identity. There's, there's not a job I know that consumes your life as much as ministry. I mean, it's the greatest job on the planet, and it's the hardest job on the planet. You, you do your professional life, you do your family life, you do your friendships, you do your spiritual pilgrimage. You, everything is wrapped up in this thing, and when it goes away, and it gets quiet fast. So good successions, the outgoing guy had something he was passionate about. It could be as pedestrian as golf or Man, I've been doing missions in India for a long time. I'd love to start a new 501c3. Uh, the church I mentioned earlier, Bethany uh, World Prayer Center, the grandson said to the dad, you love missions. Why don't we funnel all our missions through you and you direct where everything goes? And it gave his dad something that's very meaningful, high impact for the kingdom, and, and also uh, some identity for his dad to have that frees him up from trying to have identity by micromanaging the church after you're gone. Yeah. Now, just with what you just laid out and the stories that are in the book, uh, it sounds like every succession is a little bit different, a little bit unique, uh, that there's not necessarily a cookie cutter approach. But I imagine there's some similarities between successions that happen well. Um, what are some of those things that you could pretty much see when it's going to go well? These are the things that are going to happen. Okay. Okay. Uh, some of this is in the book, but we'll give you a little scoop on something, you know, that, that isn't in the book, right? If mama ain't happy, nobody's happy. So uh, the outgoing pastor's wife in good successions, the church honored her. And I'm assuming male pastors, because that I think is most of the time the case. Um, the, the church honored her. The church found a way for her to have social networks and not have to pull up every route that was planted for her whole life, raising children and all these, you know, social networks that come up. Uh, and the outgoing pastor's wife made it a mission to see the whole thing succeed. And, uh, you know, Dr. Criswell at First Baptist Dallas, who's just a legend, right? Um, he followed Dr. Truett. So Truett Seminary, Criswell College, I mean, two giants. It was like 90 some years with the two of them as pastor. Uh, there, we've uncovered one story. Early in Dr. Criswell's tenure, he, he hit a pretty rough patch. And, you know, there was it was probably questionable as to whether he was going to make it or not. And a lot of people point of draw a straight line back to Ms. Truett reaching out to Ms. Criswell, offering a hand, and that sort of opening the door to a new level of acceptance and success. So that's a that's a thing you wouldn't think of. I mean, that was kind of a surprise finding in the book. But, you, man, take care of the spouse, and you will take care of your house. So, yeah. Um, I would say that the, the two big patterns that we saw, uh, mentioning the research and the common themes, uh, when the pastor has some financial security, that helps a lot. And pastors, 
I mean, Paul, I can't tell you the number of searches I've done where the pastor refused to take a raise, just give it to the missions budget, refused to take a raise, to, and lived a very simple life, and then it came time to retire. And they didn't realize, I have a housing allowance that's tax-free. Uh, people take me to lunch. Oh, I forgot that somebody loans me a car, or all these little things that happen, and they start running a worksheet, and all of a sudden, they should have taken the raises. So yeah. <laughs> financial security, uh, spousal security, and then some form of identity. And, and frankly, a bad succession would be the most expensive thing a church can go through. It, it, it slows them down. Sometimes it splits the church. I mean, you've seen this, I know, in your ministry. Uh, you've watched it in churches. And it, frankly, I think boards would do well to find a way to help their outgoing pastor, if they're at retirement age, uh, launch into a new venture. Uh, we've set up rabbi trusts before to help financial security. Uh, we've helped churches set up mission organizations and, and put seed capital in for three years. So the pastor has three years to kind of build up financial support and be self-sustaining. That, that sounds crazy. It sounds um, lavish. But frankly, it's a lot less expensive than if you go through a bad succession. And that, sorry to sound blunt. I hope that's not too corporate for you. No, no it's, it's helpful. Thank you. You mentioned what sometimes things do go wrong. Uh, when things go wrong in a succession, what are some of the common mistakes that pastors and churches make? Yeah. So uh, let's talk about like a normal. So a pastor is going to go through probably three transitions in their career, if it, okay. statistically. So not just the retirement time, because frankly, I'd love to think that young pastors are going to read this book and think about maybe I'm going to go plant a church one day. How do I transition well? So I think there is, uh, when it goes well, the outgoing pastor has a relentless commitment to the next person's success. And that takes a secure person. Uh, frankly, it's the, if, you, if you want to not be secure and be selfish, just do it as your best chance to have a personal legacy. Because uh, people will remember you leaving well. I think that uh, the churches that are accepting new pastors have to have a, a forward thinking mindset. Like we're not going to dwell on the past. We're, churches that do transitions well tend to be forward thinking churches. Like what's next? How do we take the next hill? Uh, pastors that walk into highly established places and do well, no matter what staff role, uh, we found tend to be really interested in history. It's kind of a, uh, a, you wouldn't think that out loud, but there's a story in the book of one really great succession where the pastor just loves telling stories about the glory days of the church from a hundred years ago and how it links to their next mission initiative. And, it, and just that honoring the past and the congregation honoring a commitment to the future makes a huge difference. Now, in all that, you mentioned the board a little bit a couple moments ago. Um, what's the board's role in, a, in a, a successful succession? Yeah, you know, Bob Russell uh, has a little book. that's a case study of his succession. It's really good. It's called Transition Plans. Nice little look at a uh, really good transition. Uh, in it, he says, if the pastor is bringing up this conversation, it's succession. If the board brings the conversation to the pastor, it's termination. <laughs> so, but I don't think it has to be that way. I mean, I think that we've been in a, in a time now where corporate America has been talking succession long enough that church boards are full of business leaders, men and women, who are used to hearing that conversation. So I think having some normalized conversation about, hey, Let's talk right now about what it's going to look like when you leave. And let's do that on an emergency basis. Uh, the whole what if a plane goes down kind of thing. Yeah. And yeah. then let's do it on a long-term basis. What are we, are we grooming successors? Are we building an internship? Do we have a leadership pipeline? And I think uh, having an annual review at the, at the bare minimum every three years, but some form of annual conversation, whether it's your annual retreat or some place where it's not just a sidebar, but some dedicated time to say, how are we doing on this? Because people change and churches change and the transition plan can change. So I, I just think uh, awareness and a disarming conversation from the board saying, hey, this is not a termination conversation. This is just a, a reality, you know, that sooner or later you're going to leave. Help us help you be secure financially, secure in your identity 
and build a pipeline of people that can come after you in whatever department you serve or as the senior pastor. Yeah, that's great. So normalize the conversation, set expectations early. Yeah, and, and frankly, this may sound a little too uh, metrics driven, but I think they're probably in, in the future, you're going to see some church boards at the beginning of a pastorate, you sit down and you map out your vision, you know, you frame out what are our metrics, whether it's spiritual growth or missions or church planting or, ch- or church growth, uh, our own growth. Uh, and we'll just say, you know, as long as these things are coming along, we're fine, but we will hit a plateau at some point. Yeah. And let's go ahead and predefine what that plateau looks like. So that when it happens, it's not a surprise to anybody and you don't have to put beloved old yeller out back and shoot him in the head. You know, it's like, okay, we've seen it coming and we're ready. Wow. I just uh, feel like I need to go to the vet now. (laughs) (laughs) What, uh, what are some, you know, away from the financial side of things and the, the conversations early on setting expectations, what are some things pastors can do? Uh, early uh, now uh, to prepare their staff, to prepare their church body for succession. It's one thing for that to happen between closed doors with between sure. the board and the pastor. But sure. one, I'd say uh, there's one chapter in the book that's worth just buying the book for. It's the Ten Commandments of Succession Planning. It is, it is the baseline things that people can do. I think we've even got a white paper we can send you guys the link for uh, on half of that or something like that. But uh, we'll, we'll send it along. One, the first thing is read this book and don't read it alone. Uh, I think pastors can get ready by finding some trusted people to read the book with. And then at the right time, uh, with the advice of people older and wiser or, or trusted friends, introduce the, the board to the book and, and do it in a way that says, I'm not leaving, but I'd like for us to read this as a resource together. Uh, so that you've got some common language, and some common vocabulary. Uh, I got an email yesterday from a pastor who pre-ordered the book, a pastor of a church of about uh, 15,000 in attendance, so big church, and I hadn't heard from him in a long time. And he just he called me and said, thank you for the book. And then he wrote me and uh, said, you know, next to the Bible, next is the most important book in this year of my life. I'm in my 50s, and I wish I'd have read this sooner. So, I, you know, it's like the old Chicago voting rules. Uh, read early and read often. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, I would say that would be a big thing is develop a common language and, and bring the board in at the right time after you've got your own understanding and some trusted advisors to talk things through with. Uh, I, it's going to sound self-serving, but I would say get a neutral third party in the conversation when it gets real. And that might be uh, if you're in a denominational situation, maybe your bishop or district superintendent or or whatever the the nomenclature is. Uh, It might be a a pastor who's kind of a a father figure for the church in another in another pastorate. Uh, It could be a search consultant. I'm not trying to, you know, blow ourselves up here, but we do quite a bit of it. Just somebody that has some expertise and does not have a vested financial interest and what the outcome is. Um, yeah. So I think those are a couple of things that pastors could do to help boards get ready. Well, William, I appreciate your investment in the kingdom. And uh, this is going to be a great resource for, for churches and, and for pastors. And another book's going to give people a lot of great tips and uh, get people going on the right direction, the right trajectory. But uh, if they do run into a snag, if they do need help, I know you guys do help churches with succession planning, right? We do. And it's, it's, uh, big part of the growth in our business is people calling us and uh, it's not a, uh, my friends in corporate search think I'm a lunatic for doing things like spending days with churches. They're like, man, there's more drama. There's lower pay. What do you do this for? But we, we love seeing churches win. we really do think it's the hope of the world and, and they are very unique. So churches can call us. We can come in help them get them off the ground with a succession plan and, and uh, hopefully a transition to the next person. Well, William, thank you. It's great to connect with you. It's great uh, to spend some time with you. Thank you for putting in the work to make this book become a, a resource for churches. So thank you. Well, thank you. You're on the front lines, man. You got my heart being uh, right out there in ministry and uh, love to see you guys succeeding and, and glad to just be able to watch from the side and uh, cheer you on. Thanks, William. Take care, Paul.